fans, welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. In today's installment, we're going to look at JPA, the Java Persistence API. Now, JPA uh, is a long-standing API. It's been around forever and a day, and uh, it has certainly enjoyed a lot of use uh, in the Spring ecosystem and beyond. Uh, and particularly, its most famous implementation, Hibernate, has a, a long history uh, with with Spring. I, I think w one of the um, really really powerful sort of multiplicative uh, things that allowed Spring to to prosper early on was to embrace Hibernate, for example, to embrace o ORMs that did a really good job of, uh, of managing persistence, right? Um, and so Hibernate uh, is the thing we're going to use today, uh, although JPA itself is a specification, and it can be used uh, with a number of different implementations, of which Hibernate is just one. It happens to be the most popular, most pervasive uh, one, but it is just one. There's uh, others, for example, like Eclipse Link. And Spring Boot itself, uh, of course, um, by virtue of the fact that its implementation, its support, uh, is is based on JPA, uh, doesn't really care which implementation you use. You could use Eclipse uh, Link, for example. You could use, uh, you know, Hibernate. You can use a number of different ones. So uh, today, though, we're going to confine ourselves to just using Hibernate, and we're going to build a new uh, application as usual uh, here at start.spring.io, and uh, we'll call this JPA. We're going to use the MySQL support. We're going to use Lumbuck to make short work of some of the tediousness of Java. Uh, we'll use Timeleaf and the web support. We'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, we're going to use JPA, naturally. Um, and I think, for now, uh, that will be enough. That's enough to, to get us started. We've got Lumbuck, MySQL, Timeleaf, web, and JPA. Uh, and we'll hit Generate, and that'll give us a new project, which I'll open up in my ID, IDE here. Okay, UAO, JPA.zip. And we're going to start with a very simple application. We're going to map two entities to a table, to a database rather, uh, and to tables in my database. And, and I've got a database running on my local machine. I've got a MySQL instance running on my local machine called CRM. It's a schema. There's no tables there yet, uh, but we're going to go ahead and use JPA to create those uh, instances, those database uh, tables. So let's do that. We have to tell Spring how to connect to the database. That's the first thing. And this is not uh, any different than you would do with any other JDBC-based technology. So my beta is JOQ, JPA, or just straight JDBC. I covered JDBC, my beta, and JOQ, and other Spring Tips installments. So this should look, uh, at this point, very familiar. So we're going to say spring.datasource.url, and it'll be uh, JDBC colon mysql colon forward slash forward slash host name port, which is usually 3306, uh, the name of the uh, schema, which is CRM in this case, and we're going to tell uh, MySQL to not use SSL on my local node. We need to configure a password, that'll be CRM. Uh, we need to configure a username, and of course that'll be username, uh, will be uh, CRM as well. Now, granted, this should not live in a property file in a real application, but um, you know, for now. We'll just use it there. Okay, so that's that's the um, the basic bones of the configuration that we need. Uh, but we also want to um, tell uh, JPA to generate the SQL for us. So we're going to say yes. Uh, it'll generate the DDL, the, the schema tables, and so on, all the constructs, the primary keys, uh, etc., automatically by looking at our uh, our objects. Now, keep in mind, you don't want this property in production. You should definitely not use this property in production. In fact, I would normally put this under a separate property file called application-dev, for example, where dev is the name of a Spring profile that you activate only on your local dev machine. So if you deploy into production and you don't have you know, spring.profiles.active equals dev, uh, then it won't get activated, right? Um, or uh, go a step further and use something like Flyway or Liquibase, uh, both of which are database migration tools which are purpose-built for managing the evolution of schema uh, and uh, rolling back if necessary. All of which are, um, uh, you could use in tandem with this, but uh, certainly uh, you wouldn't use this in lieu of that. Now, uh, we're going to use uh, generate, generate DDL. We want that. We also want to show the SQL that's going to be uh, output here. So behind the scenes, remember, J JPA is just a, a giant ORM. It's an object relational mapper. And its job is to take our Java objects, our JVM objects, and to map them to the appropriate constructs in our database layer. Uh, and when it does that, it sometimes uh, um, it sometimes does a poor job. Sometimes we have to give it uh, a, a nudge here, or a, 
a hint there about what to do, and we can't know that it's doing a poor job unless we can see the SQL that it's generating, for example. So uh, it's useful to have this uh, statement activated, um, especially in development. Again, these two things might be uh, things you file away uh, for development. All right. All right. Now we have our application, and we're going to manage uh, uh, two types of records. One is called a customer, and a customer will be a uh, a thing that will you know store in the database. It's a record that's going to manage customer information. So class customer, uh, and then customers will have a record of their orders, how many orders they've they've made. All right, and we're going to signal that these are JPA entities, like so, and uh, we'll give each one a primary key at ID at generate value, uh, and that's going to be turned into a um, and by the way, this is important. Notice that I'm being given the choice between using Spring Data's ID annotation, which is useful in a number of different Spring Data modules, uh, all of, almost all of them, in fact, except for JPA. Uh, so we'll use JPAs. Make sure to do the right thing there. Uh, we're going to give them both two auto incrementing uh, unique uh, IDs, right? So these are not natural IDs. These are just auto incrementing, auto -incrementing surrogate IDs, uh, and we can use that. That's fine. Uh, and our customer will now have some fields. So we're going to say the first field is called order uh, first. Uh, then the first name rather is going to be called first. Now I want to I want to exert control over the column that's used to store this uh, this, this data. Okay. So in Java code it's going to be called first, but in the SQL schema it'll be called first name. By default it would just be named after the field. Uh, and if we had done something like first name, then it would have done uh, it would have underscored it based on or, or would have done whatever we had. Asked to do, asked it to do via strategy, but in this case, we're just going to override it on the um, on the site of the declaration of the field. Okay, so there's the first and last names, uh, and then of course we want the collection of orders. And I'm going to use a set because I don't really care in what order the data is returned, uh, just so long as I have the data. Right, so I'll say new hash set. Now this is a one-to-many collection. I'm going to have uh, one customer and potentially many orders. And those orders, if you look at the schema, are going to be keyed based on the foreign key uh, in the order table that points to the current customer. So we want to join, we want to tell the ORM to load the customer and then load all the, all the orders uh, in a separate query, in one query though, and load all the orders by looking for the orders that have the foreign key that has the ID of this customer, and, and so to in order to, in order to map that, we're going to say that this is a one-to-many relationship. We're going to say that all operations should cascade to the subordinate uh, objects here, uh, and then we're also going to say that we want to remove the orphan records uh, if there are any. So we don't basically we don't want any extra orders laying around if we should delete the customer, right? So that's uh, that's there, and then we also need to give it a clue as to what um, join column to use. So we're going to say join column name equals, and we're going to say let's just say that we want the order table to have a foreign key called customer fk. Okay. Now this is a another instance. Uh, you know, this, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a product order, like an order on a website, um, and uh, that's the that's an interesting table name uh, because order is a reserved keyword in certain dialects of. Uh, in, uh, in si certain SQL dialects, certain in MySQL's dialect, right? Um, and we don't want to run afoul of the of the parser, so I'm going to rename this table to orders. And you know, just to be consistent, I'll rename this one customers. All right. So there we are. There's our two different uh, records. They relate to each other. Um, this is a one-to-many relationship. You, you know, you could also do a bi-directional thing. You could actually have order have a reference to the customer if you want. In this case, I don't really need it in this case, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's nice to have. Uh, we also want to have a skew. That's I think as complicated as we're going to get with this domain. A skew is just a product product code. Uh, and now our job is to write some data to the database. So we're going to go ahead and use um, Spring's basic JPA support before we even get to Spring Data and uh, some of the more sophisticated support. We're going to use the absolute basic support that's been in Spring forever. I mean, just you know, since since JPA came out, basically circa um, 
what is it now? When did JPA came out? Uh, you know, early 2000s, okay? So that support, uh, let's see, JPA application writer. We're just gonna write some data to the database using a, a callback listener here, uh, application runner. And when the application starts up, we'll, uh, we'll inject the current um, entity manager. So the support in, sp in Spring, Spring Framework and, and so on, uh, for JPA originates, I think if you had to pick one, uh, it's in the local uh, entity manager factory bean. Okay, so here's the local entity manager factory bean. And this thing, uh, it's been around since 2.0, right? Um, right now, if you're using Spring Framework 5 uh, in mid-2018, then you're going to be using uh, the uh, JPA 2.1 support. You have to have that as a runtime uh, image. But um, but basically, all this is a. Uh, it's been around for a long time, and the the main thing that this does, the main thing that this uh, support does, is it gives you a um, a entity manager that is aware of Spring infrastructure, things like transactions and so on, and it also gives you a entity manager that is uh, thread safe, or rather, it's it's um, a proxy around a number of different entity managers that themselves are thread local. So keep in mind, the entity manager per the spec is not thread safe. Uh, and this, this is okay because the specification uh, was written, for example, for technologies like EJB3, where the, uh, the entity manager would be assumed to be injected. You write something like this. At persistence context, entity manager, M, okay, and uh, you could. By the way, this will actually work in Spring. I don't, I don't happen to like this style. I tend to use constructor injection, so private file, like that. But the um, the the style assumes that the containing object is going to ever only be used by one thread. Well, keep in mind that Spring objects are single tips. There's one instance, no matter how many threads. So if you keep, if you inject a pointer to a service, for example, that uses uh, an entity manager, and you make calls to that service from different threads, for example, the many different threads uh, being used to service requests arriving at, for example, a servlet container. Well, each time you make a call to that service, you're invoking a method in that service that then invokes the entity manager in that thread, in the, you know, the original thread. Uh, as a result, you're making concurrent calls to that entity manager uh, that you shouldn't be doing, right? Remember how EJBs work. EJBs are pooled. You have multiple uh, objects in a pool, and the container, the application server, uh, gets an instance of that bean and allots an instance of that bean for each incoming request. And then it uh, destroys that bean or puts it back into the pool. And there's this whole passivation and activation lifecycle that you have to be aware of, and, and so on. So you go, you know, in, in EJBs, they go out of their way to make sure that you can write code that is essentially uh, single-threaded, um, even though it has to be used in a multi-threaded world. Well, in Spring, uh, it's just one bean. You just have one object. It's multi-threaded. It has to be multi-threaded. Whatever you do in there is multi-threaded. Uh, and so if you use an entity manager, you have to be aware of that. And so Spring uh, actually creates a proxy. We give you a proxy of the entity manager that itself then manages a whole pool of entity managers and makes sure that there's an entity manager on the current thread uh, on which you're making that request. So the result ultimately is that, well, it just works. You can write code that looks exactly like what you might have seen in EGB3 circa 2005, um, but it just works, right? The benefit is that you can uh, just write code and move on. So now we have this basic entity manager. Now we need to use uh, a transaction. We need to actually run this code in a transaction, right, in order for this to work. So um, uh, to use a regular naked entity manager, you need a transaction. So I'm going to use uh, I, I could, if I were building a service, I could use the add transaction, transactional a annotation on the service, and then all the methods therein would be enclosed in a transaction whenever you invoke those methods. But in order to be able to run multiple things in the same run method, I'm going to demarcate my transaction boundaries uh, manually here using the transaction template. Okay, and the transaction template uh, has already been wired up for us. It's been configured for us by Spring Boot. Uh, and it's been given a pointer to the JPA 
transaction manager. Okay. JPA transaction manager. There we are. And this thing uh, is aware of JPA transactions. So again, it's, that's a, an implementation of the uh, resource local transaction management facility in JPA. Um, and uh, this transaction template gives us a unified API that we can use to, to uh, st start and stop the transactions to work with them and so on. So you just basically use the template method called execute and everything inside that gets executed inside of transactions. Now, um, one thing I should say is that you could also use with JPA, you could use JTA, the Java Transaction API, the, um, the API that is the client-side middleware for the XOpen protocol. Uh, and I've done another Spring Tips installment on JTA, and I encourage you to check that out. Uh, and if you use JTA with Hibernate and with JPA and with Spring, well, suffice it to say, there's a whole galaxy of things that you need to get right uh, in order to do that, right? Um, but Spring Boot, Spring Boot on the other hand, goes out of its way to make that kind of thing work for you. So if you look at the JPA auto configuration here, Hibernate JPA auto configuration, uh, you can see that uh, this is going to use the local container entity manager factory bean, uh, and it's going to import the Hibernate JPA configuration. And you can see that this configuration is uh, code that you don't want to write. Trust me, you do not want to write this code. Uh, this code is code that configures Hibernate, uh, and it configures the the J. So that it, conf can, it configures the JTA transaction manager based on either the application server environments, uh, JNDI bound transaction manager, and or user transaction, uh, and it then configures the properties that. Hibernate needs to know about the vendor specific properties that Hibernate needs to know about uh, to then delegate to the Spring JTA Transaction Manager, uh, except of course in WebSphere where of course things break horribly uh, because WebSphere is weirder than all the other uh, app servers. So uh, we, you know, this code knows about all those atrocities and it uh, and it makes it work for you. So basically, you can get, you can use this. It'll do the right thing for you. And if you're using, and, and if you want to use JTA as described in that other video, uh, you'll, you'll, you know, it'll work. It just works, right? That's um, that's code you don't want to write. That uh, trust me, nobody else wants to write. But it, it's done for you, right? Now we have this. Um, let's just write some data. Let's write some very very simple data to the database using the Naked Entity Manager API. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say tt dot execute, right? Transaction template. Uh, and that'll give me a um, a callback, and that callback has an expectation that I return a value. In this case, I can return a null. I could actually use the new transaction callback without without result or something like that if I liked. But uh, here, I'm going to just use the uh, the, the version that takes a, a, a return value because I'd rather use a lambda form instead of having to use the anonymous inner class form that the, um, the other variants require. Now, let's write some data to the data. So we're going to hard code some users. You know, I, I do this a lot. So Dave hyphen sire, we're going to write some people as customers. So Phil hyphen, uh, Phil comma web, and uh, of course, Mark comma Fisher. So there we are. We've got some names. I'm going to split the names uh, into, uh, it's, it's an array of names there. And then I'm going to map each name into a tuple. I'm going to split the name in but into two, into common, uh, into the first and the last name. Uh, and then, finally, I'll visit the tuple, I'll vi visit each tuple, and I'm going to persist the data. I'm going to say this.em.persist new customer. And here, I've got the customer. Now, this customer needs a constructor. And for JPA, I want probably, I, I probably want uh, getters and setters and equals and hash code and all that kind of stuff. So here I use I make heavy use of lumbuck. So I'll say at data at all arg constructors at no arg constructors. Right? And remember you need a no argument constructor for JPA. It doesn't have to be public, but you do need it. Right? So this is useful. You can actually you can actually say uh, um, force equals true and you can do all sorts of you can say access equals uh, private and then force equals true. So you could you could do stuff like that, but I don't care. I just Fine, whatever. Okay, good. So we've got that now, um, and we're gonna 
save some data now that we've got our constructors. The constructor that we get is a it takes an ID for the null for the ID. The first name will be of course the first part of the tuple. The second name will be the second part of the tuple, and then we'll just return a give it a list of uh, uh, rather a set of orders, uh, an empty set of orders. So there we go. We have our data uh, that we've persisted into the database. And now we're going to use the, uh, the the entity manager to create a query. So I'm going to create a query here. Select C from customer C where uh, well just, that's it actually. We'll just use that. And we're going to say that we want a typed list of customer data back. And what I mean by that is that uh, the query query method will give us a um, typed query object. Okay. So here we are, customer. And with that, I'm going to ask for the result list, and I'll visit each one that comes back. So here's each customer, and I want to log out information about that. So I'm going to, I'm going to have Lumbox synthesize a log for J logger for me, as well. I'll say log .info. Um typed query result will be, and then here I'm going to use Commons Lang uh, to log out the information that we get we got to get back because I'm going to do that a fair bit for the time that we are spending together uh, looking at different results. So I'm going to just say commons lang 3. I'll bring that in. It's the version's already managed for me so I just have to declare it and uh, and and then use it. So I'm going to say uh, log dot info uh, to string builder dot reflection to string customer. All right. So there we are. Oh, we've already got logged that info, don't we? So we don't need that. Goodbye. All right. So let's see what we get if we run this code as as written. What in the? Are my server? I think you're confused, my friend. Yeah, it was definitely confused. All right. So we have some sort of error. What is the error? Oh, zero indexed. Very good. So look at that. We've uh, written the data. We've uh, written the data. We can see that Hibernate was uh, nice enough to to create those tables for us in the last run. Uh, but we can see we had to add the constraint here, so it's still doing some stuff. And uh, here's the insert. Calls the three different inserts, uh, and then the query that we just uh, that we just ran, uh, and since none of them had any other records, uh, we didn't you know, we didn't visit any of those records. Uh, we got the we got everything as we expected. So there's the results, the first name, the last name, and the empty orders collection. All right, so that worked out just fine. That's uh, you know works out just fine. Let's go ahead and now add some orders to um, to uh, see what we have, right? To see what we can do with that that nested or that uh, subordinate collection. Uh, but in order to make working with JPA just a little bit easier, instead of using the regular entity manager, which, you know, to be fair, wasn't so bad. We just uh, injected it and used it. Life is good. Uh, in order to make it a little bit easier, I like to use Spring Data Repositories. Okay, so I'm going to create a customer repository uh, that's going to extend the JPA repository and manipulate entity entities of type customer whose primary key uh, is of type long. Now, it would be, I think it's probably interesting for the audience to know that the JPA repository was the first repository type supported in Spring Data. It, it came from a, a third party project, a, a, a community project maintained by what is, who is now Spring Data lead Oliver Gerke uh, uh, called Hades, H A D E S. And uh, it had a, uh, you know, it has a, had this interface based mechanism for, for querying data. All right. Um, so that's the JPA repository, and I can use this to read and write and save and manipulate data. So we're going to do that here. Let's um, create another transaction. Okay. I, you know, I don't care about the status, actually. And in the status, in the transaction, rather, we're going to write data to the database. We're going to write orders to each for each uh, uh, customer. So we're going to say, um, let's inject the customer repository here. Okay, private final customer repository, and add that to the constructor. Very good. And now we're going to write some data to the database. We're going to say return null for our status, uh, and 
Let's get all the records. So I said customer repository. I find all. Get all the customers back. And then for each customer, I want to create some more data. So I'm going to create some orders. So I'm going to say uh, um, int max equals math dot random times uh, five. And uh, we want to turn that into an integer and then cast it. All right. So there's our count count of orders and we're going to say for int i equals 0 i is less than count of orders i plus plus and we'll s add a record to the customer's orders collection giving it a consistent skew right so we're at, we want to be able to query that later so skew will be skew and let's just add a hyphen it's not what a real skew looks like but it's fine um, very good. And uh, so now we've got a, a number of different records, each of which is going to have their own real ID, but they should have common SKU numbers. Okay, there should be a common set of SKU numbers there. And of course, we need to save that change uh, to the database. I'm going to say I'm going to save the aggregate. A repository is typically mapped at the aggregate. So this order is the is not the aggregate. The customer is the aggregate. All right. And uh, all of this will occur in a transaction. So of course, were I to throw an exception. Here, for example, uh, then even though I've done all this work by that point, uh, it would all be rolled back. You wouldn't see it reflected in the in the database. All right, now let's go ahead and run this. Okay, looks like it worked. Very good. So we know that's working now. Uh, let's query the data. Let's actually interrogate the data some more uh, and see um, what we get and how we can query it. So I looked at, I, I wrote a, a manual query here using the entity manager. I used that, e, you know, EM select C from customer C, whatever. And the IDE is trying its level headed best to help me here, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm a big believer of not having strings in your code if you can avoid it. So we're going to use the repository to create custom finder methods here. So the first finder is going to be based on the parameters, right? The, the, the predicate. So I'm going to say, give me a collection of customers find by first and last. String F, string L. So that'll work. That'll give me all the customers by their first name and their last name. So let's try that. So turn null. And here, we're going to Say customer repository, find by first and last. So Dave Sire, and that'll give us a collection of people that match. Dave's Dave. And we're gonna log out Dave here. Alright, so two string builder dot reflection, two string Dave. Very good. So there we go. So let's let's see if that query works as we expected it to. And indeed, it has. There's our um, there's our different records there. So you can see I've got three records here uh, for I've got three days basically because I've run this program multiple times and my SQL has retained the data across those different runs. So what I'm going to do just to keep things a little clean, I'm going to just say uh, I'm going to say that I want to use the customer repository to delete everything first just to clean up the records here a little bit. Let's go ahead and rerun the code. All right, so there's now just one day on the console, right? And we have uh, zero orders for this particular one. Try again, try our luck. There we go. So this in this run, there are uh, more than one order uh, in the uh, you know, attached to that customer. Now, that's a, a very automatic sort of convention-based query. That query that we created in the repository here uh, is based on a convention, and this is true across all the different Spring Data projects. Uh, you can give it a, uh, you can create finder methods that go beyond the default support in these common repositories. This repository supports finding, saving, flushing, deleting, etc. Uh, deleting and batch, you know, whatever's appropriate for the technology at hand, and you can create custom finders. You can also, of course, of course, create your own custom finder methods with custom querying, uh, you know, 
query names and, and so on. So by full name, string f, string l. And here I'm going to use a custom query. I'm going to say select c from customer c where c dot first equals f and c dot last equals l. And in order for that to work, Spring Data needs to know the name of the parameter. So we give it a param annotation, f and l, and then we can use that. So let's revisit the same code basically by full name. And uh, I suppose we can start breaking this up a little bit here. All right. Let's run that code again. Okay, so there we are, the same same result as you'd expect. Nothing is particularly different here. Um, so we have the uh, the or the customer, and we have the orders, that, uh, and uh, and that's working just fine. Uh, now, um, in this case, I've used a custom query. You know, I want to be able to do more interesting things that uh, don't necessarily map necessarily to the the aggregate entity at hand here. I might want to do things that are uh, you know that involve derived views of the data, right? And so in this case, we can use a native query, okay? This is a feature that's nice in JPA is you can actually get access to the full power of SQL. It is a little cumbersome, and I think this is one of the big drawbacks of using uh, an ORM like JPA is that uh, you are a long way removed from the native SQL, but you, you can still get there. It's just you need to know where to look, okay? So we're going to create a report, basically. We're going to create a new endpoint that returns the collection of orders, the summary about all orders. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, order summary. Okay. And in order for this to work, of course, we need a project, a type called an order summary. So we're going to use something called a projection, and the projection is going to be an, uh, an implementation of an interface that we're going to give to JPA, and that projection is going to have the count and the skew, right? So we want to create a collection uh, that uses that, and we need to tell Hibernate and uh, JPA that this is going to be mapped to a native query, and that native query will, will be resolved by looking for one of the native queries that we've registered with JPA with the name order qu order summary, so customer.order summary. Uh, in order for us to have that query, we need to register it here on our entity, so we're going to say at named native queries, they can have more than one associated with an entity, for example, at named native query, not hibernate, shout out to persistence, and the name of the query will be customer dot order summary, and the query itself will be select skew as skew and count id as count so again, this is important. You need to have the, the aliasing there so that they match with the properties that we get from this. So count and skew are the properties in our projection there. Uh, from, and uh, it's called orders, right? We need the orders. Group by skew. Okay. So there's our native query. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to get that right. I guess that's as good as it gets. Like that. Whatever, let's just leave it like that. Okay, so we've got now our entity. Uh, we've got a query. Uh, let's see if that works. Let's actually run this query now. Let's run the uh, see the results there. So take one of those. Customer repository dot order summary dot for each summary. We want to visit the data that comes back. Um, and uh, to the same thing as before. Two string builder reflection two string summary. Alrighty, good stuff. Let's see what that gives us. So, that should have given us a uh, proxy, but that's not what we want, is it? We want to look at the data. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll just have to print it out uh, the old-fashioned way. 
Yeah, let's just do that. Okay, so let's say summary dot uh, get skew has summary dot get count instances. All right, run that code again. All right, there you go. So you can see that there are three instances of the skew, of skew zero. Uh, you know, three instances of skew one, two instances of skew two, one instance of skew three. So that's actually that you know that means that you know you can you can understand the breakdown there, right? We have a uh, how many you know given the four possible skews, um, or rather five possible skews, what what w how many instances of each skew exist? You know, do which customers? We didn't look at the customers here. We just looked at the uh, the summary here using the aggregate function uh, uh, count. Okay. So you can get access to you can get access to low level SQL, and I think this is one of my favorite features in in Hibernate is to be able to use uh, the low level SQL engine, which is very powerful, and have that mapped automatically to these types, these strongly typed uh, types. Right, this is what we want um, to happen after all, is to get get the work of marshaling whatever comes back from this into a uh, or rather from this into a uh, a type safe representation that we can use. Okay, so now we have a custom query. We looked at different queries. Uh, we looked at uh, named queries. So we are now in a good place to look at slightly more, slightly more advanced uh, uh, use cases. Let's suppose I wanted to build a web application. Okay, so let's build a web application. I've got Timely. You might recall Timely is a a view templating engine, uh, and uh, I have Spring Boot start a web on the class path. And so both of these will ha let me build a web application, and I'm going to build a REST controller that works with this data. Or not not a REST controller, just a regular controller, actually a view. So it'll be called the customer controller, and I'm going to inject the customer repository here, and uh, we'll create an endpoint that has an HTML page with a view of all the data. Now think about what's happening here. I've got uh, that data, customers dot, you know whatever view okay it doesn't matter uh, and the name of the page customers model data turn customer so I've got a view and that view is going to render and in the view and we'll look at the view in a minute but in the view I'm going to have all the customer records and each one of those customer records as we've seen before also has a collection of orders well in JPA this collection of orders is lazy. What you actually have in the resulting runtime application is not a concrete hash set, but it's a, uh, a proxied type that comes from the bowels of Hibernate. We don't need to know what it is or how it works, but suffice it to say, this is not actually all of the subordinate records. You only get the subordinate records if you touch or iterate over those orders. So if you just hold on to a pointer to a customer uh, and, don't, and, and don't do anything with the orders themselves, then no data will be loaded from the database. As soon as you start to iterate through those records, as I do, for example, whenever I use the two string builder and that recursively, uh, you know, recursively and reflectively descends into the orders collection, <clears throat> whenever you start to do that, uh, it then has to load the data from the database, right? And um, in the best case, it's just one more extra query. In the worst case, you get the n plus one problem where you have uh, a single select for each order. And that's a whole other t topic. We could talk about a thousand different. Uh, things related to query optimization and so on. But for our purposes, what we need to know is that this is by default lazy. And so if you send this customer to another context outside of a, a current transaction, outside of the current running transaction with JPA, uh, well then we're going to run into some trouble if we try and visit any of those orders. And so if you imagine we move this customer to a view to be rendered. Okay, And uh, if we want to render it, we need to be able to make sure that that data gets loaded correctly. So I, here I am doing nothing to take care of those records. And I still want to render it in this view. And this view I have to create. I'll create the view here. Source main resources templates. Create a new file here called customers.html. That's a, a view template for time leaf. And uh, I am nothing if not lazy, my friend. So I'm going to just copy it here. Okay, paste, and you can see what's happening here. It's a very simple view. It says, for each customer C and the customer's model attribute, 
print out an H2 element with the first name and the last name, and then visit each order and print out the ID and the SKU. All right, and I suppose we could actually um, have some sort of delimiter here. I guess uh, let's think about that. How would that work? Style uh, border hyphen top one px solid black. There we go. So now you can see, um, hopefully, if my HTML, if my CSS foo is not so terrible, you can see uh, which order. You know, you can see all the different orders. Actually, each line will be in order, so we don't need that at all. So let's just leave that is as is, and then see what happens if we run this code. So this is a Spring MVC controller, localhost, 8080, customers.view, and there we go. We can see the ID of the SKU and the actual SKU itself, and we can see how many customers we have in the database. So again, this is a random random list of orders just to demonstrate the point. But um, you can see SKU 0 is in there uh, one, two, three times, right? So if we go back to our report here, you can see that it says SKU 0 has three instances. So that's working out just fine, right? We're actually able to look at the data, even though we've moved it across a different boundary uh, outside of the transaction. And the way we're able to do that is that by default, Spring Boot configures the open session in view, or, or open uh, entity manager in view pattern. So here it says Spring JPA open in view equals true. If I set it to false, which you might want to do, you know, you might want to be defensive about, about what you pass down to the view layer, so that by that point you can't actually um, hit the database. So if I hit that, if I specify that property and set it to be false, uh, let's see what happens if I now visit that page. Boom, right? Uh, the big error that we just we were just given is that it's failed to lazily initialize a collection of role blah blah blah. So it's it's telling me that there's no session uh, open uh, for it to then materialize that lazy collection of data. So uh, you don't you know you should know about this feature. Uh, it's being configured for you automatically. We've automatically Spring has had for the longest time the open entity manager and view filter. Uh, that's this thing here. Uh, and Spring Boot automatically just configured it for you if you want it there. So this has been around forever. Uh, it's just nice to know that Spring Boot has gone the extra mile to make that available and to make it work for you automatically so that things just work. Okay. All right. So now we've got an application. It has a endpoint, an HTML application, uh, HTML view. Uh, but this is data. This is order data. And so you might say that this is, uh, especially in the world of, um, you know, being being compromised by hackers and uh, and in, in the world of finance and all that kind of stuff. This kind of stuff is super important. It's important that we have the ability to uh, look at the data to be able to see what's happened to it. Uh, and so for this reason, we're going to use uh, Spring Data's support for auditing. Okay, We're going to actually uh, externalize, we're going to configure some of the um, uh, some, some information that we want to be visible in every single record, including uh, the date it was created, the date it was modified, uh, and possibly even the user who created and or modified that, that entity. So we want to have that uh, visible. Uh, in order for us to do that, we need to say, first of all, we have to go up here and say, at enable JPA auditing. Okay, at enable JPA auditing. Uh, and then for each entity, we need to actually configure a number of redundant things, things that you would think we could centralize. And, and actually, that's what we're going to do is we're going to centralize all these things that are uh, repeated across the different entities. So let's go back down to our entities here, the order and the customer and create a uh, mapped superclass. This is a JPA-ism that allows you to define things that should be common across different entities in a single place. Uh, and then you can ex just extend them. So class, uh, let's just call this mapped auditable base, uh, if that's a word. And we're going to say that that we want to apply a JPA entity listener. Okay, So this is a listener called the auditing entity listener. And this is from Spring Data JPA. Again, we provide the support out of the box using this this callback hook in JPA. Uh, and we're going to define our ID in a single place. We know that all records will have a uh, surrogate auto incrementing primary key. We want to have a an idea of when the uh, when this record was created. So we're going to create a local date time field. You could also use a um, uh, a date w till date, although I wouldn't. It's Java it's 2018, so use the right thing here. And we'll, we'll use the we want the last modified date, so we're again, local date time, modified, and we want the, uh, 
created by so that's the user and we'll come back to this in a second but it's a it's a string name it could be a it could be, it could be a complete object that you map to a to an, to an entity in your uh, your, your domain uh, it can be what it want uh, but in this case uh, it's going to be just a string uh, you know the, the name of the creator user and modified by okay so and that'll be modifier right so these things have to be provided by this auditing entity listener and this is something that spring data will do for you it looks for those annotations it doesn't matter what you name um, the, uh, the fields uh, and ultimately all that thing is doing is taking advantage of hooks that you have and you can also use if you want for example pre remove pre persist pre update pre destroy post remove all these life cycle hooks so if you create a method here public void uh, post remove uh, this stuff, you know, you have to get a logger here. I guess I could just do uh, this for J, whatever. You could log something in there, do, you know, do whatever you want, do any kind of validation. So those those things are there for you, but I'm going to just leave it as is. And now we're going to extend our order and our customer from that type. So let's do that. Where's our types here? Oh, yeah, down here. Extends mapped auditable base. And extends mapped auditable base. And in this case, we don't need the IDs anymore. That'll break our Lombok configuration. But the IDs are implied by the base class, so I'm happy for that. Let's see. Here we are. Goodbye. And goodbye. Okay, so now let's run the code again. Okay, do we see the data here? Now it says created and modified. So again, that's uh, the date and time of the creation of these instances. Now, the creator field and the modifier field, the, the username or the thing that we can use to trace who made this change, are at the moment absent. In order for us to do that, in order for us to have that information, we need to tell Spring Data where to look for that information. Right? So we create a bean. Uh, just any kind of any regular old Spring Boot. I'm going to call it Auditor, and it has to implement Auditor Aware, and it has to produce the information that we're looking for. So the get get current Auditor, and it's a you know if there's nobody, then it's empty. Uh, Otherwise, we turn an option with something in it. Well, of course, this could be you could use Spring Security, right? If I if I had Spring Security on the con on the uh, class path, I could say Security Context dot uh, get you know current context and uh, blah blah blah, and get printable, and, and then stash that in there. I could return the optional of, of Java security printable. Whatever you, whatever you want to do, right? Whatever, whatever your mechanism for tracing users is. But in our case, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna inject the username, my local Unix username. So user, and I'll inject that into the constructor as a very simple example, very silly, but simple example. Obviously, in a production application, this would make very little sense since most code doesn't run. You know, most of this, most of the time, you'll have a front end, front end website, so you want to you want to know who the authenticated user is, not the uh, name of the process on which this, uh, or the name of the user on the operating system on which under which this uh, application is running. So, optional of this dot user. All right, so there we are. So there's my my um, hard coded username and password thing. This callback is what's important. So just implement that callback and tell it where to find the data, and let's see what that gets us. Alrighty, so there you go. It says J long, J long. So it's now filling in those fields for us, just as we'd hoped. Okay. Now this is, um, I think this is good. This is a good first step uh, in auditing the data. That said, um, that said, we can do better. You know, if you're in a, a high stakes environment where you need to have a full audit trail on every single change, every single mutation to every single entity uh, everywhere in the system. If you're in that situation, then uh, this may not be enough. You might want to see every single change, every single record, and they be able to, to be able to go back in time and see that. And so, uh, and there's a lot of different other use cases for this as well. Uh, change data capture, for example, is another use case where you want to be able to see uh, the changes to a given entity and then and then replay them later on. For example, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you might want this, um, and uh, and you should have it. Right? There's a there's a no reason not to have it if you need it. Uh, and relational databases are good at this kind of thing. So 
we are going to use a uh, project called Hibernate Omvers, right? Which is E E. It's it's it's, uh, it's spelled um, E N V E R S. I'm not sure where that comes from. In French, Omvers means to. It means like it's a preposition to. Uh, uh, you know, I think I'm not sure what the uh, specific use is here, but um, we're going to use that. Okay. I'm even thinking of ver. Actually, I'm not even sure what ver means. So whatever, we have this preposition. We have this word, ver, um, vers, and uh, we're going to go ahead and bring that into the project here. Uh, and we have a module, a Spring Data module, that works with vers. Okay? Works with Spring Framework Data. And I don't think a lot of people know about this project, which is a shame, because it's really, really useful. So all we need to do is we need to tell, first of all, we need to tell Spring, and Spring Data JPA in particular, um, where to find the uh, you know where to, how to configure our repositories with Omvers in the mix, right? So we actually have to override the default at the JP repository support in the Spring Boot auto configuration. We override it by using the Omvers revision repository factory bean, uh, and then we have to um, make our entities auditable. So let's go down here to each entity. There it is, audited. Where's our order? And audited. All right. And now this is from the Hibernate project, Hibernate Omvers, uh, and uh, it's a really useful project. And it will work with Hibernate, and we've already got Hibernate running, so we don't have to do much else to to get that to work um, beyond what we have there. Uh, so let's go ahead and just run this and take a look at the resulting schema. And uh, we should actually interrogate the repository. Do that in a second, but let's just see if it's stuck right. Everything should be fine. Okay, good. You can see that it's done. Um, it's done everything as before, but it's also created these tables called customers AUD, not just customers, but customers AUD and uh, orders AUD, and it's created the schema for all that too. Right, so select all from this, blah blah blah. Create table orders AUD, and then there's another table called Rev info, and we can see that all reflected here. So show tables. There we are, and so uh, look at selector. Select all from orders. There's our eleven rows. Select all from orders A U D, and so on. So we can see some interesting information there, but we don't have to worry about. We don't have to. You know, we don't have to drill down and try and reverse engineer that schema. Although you definitely should at some point. What we want to do is just use the repository to interact with that data, and so. Uh, that's fairly straightforward. We're just going to go to our repository and extend also another interface, the revision repository. And that's going to manage entities of type customer, primary keys of type long, and the type of the revision will be mapped by an integer. And with that basic extension in place, we can now add one more printout. So we, we've, got, uh, we've got to make some changes here. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got Dave, but we've only, we've only changed Dave twice. We changed everything else once, right? We created the record. Um, uh, we created, we actually, we, we modified everything twice so far. Let's go ahead and now uh, modify Dave just in particular to, uh, to, to illustrate the point. So we're going to find Dave Sire. We're going to visit Dave, visit each record in the collection that comes back. And we're going to change Dave to David. I'm not sure if that's his I don't know if he appreciates being called David, but we'll just do it because it's a uh, one is a uh, short name for the other, and uh, we're going to say customer repository dot save, Dave, and now in another transaction, we'll look for David. Sire. Uh, I'm going to get back the record. All right, and this is of course I'm talking about the good, the good doctor David Sire, who uh, is a. Uh, Friend and a hero. So here we go. We've got the uh, we've got David. I'm going to get the ID. So long ID equals David. Get ID. Oh, and I forgot the uh, map superclass also should have the uh, at that annotation from Lumbach to get the getters and setters, which makes this a little easier. Very good. And now I'm going to visit the repository. I'm going to say find revision for ID. And that's it. And then uh, find uh, find revisions for the customer entity. 
whose ID is equal to, to this. So we can actually simplify that a little bit here. And then for each revision that comes back, let's print out what we get. So log dot info uh, revision revision dot get metadata and we'll print out the uh, two string there like this for entity two string builder reflection dot two string revision dot get entity right so all I'm doing is I'm printing out the revision metadata for a given entity and we'll see it logged there. I'm uh, I'm looking up Dave just to just to get the ID basically I don't you know either. There you go. Okay, let's just run it. See what we get. Cool. So there we are. We've got three records, three revisions here. You can see we've got ID five and here's the different dates, right? Eight twenty six. Well these are all basically the same time. I wonder if we could actually uh Let's um, introduce a pause. All right, let's introduce a pause here. Thread dot sleep by two seconds. Two seconds sleep. There we are. Okay, there we go. So we can see that the the second change happened at thirty three seconds after. And the third change happened at 35 seconds after. So we can see the data there. And also you can see the changes. Look at that. You can see here's the first instance of that record called Dave. And there were zero orders. Here's the second instance of that record called Dave. And here are all the orders. Here's the third instance of that record for David, not Dave, and the same number of orders. So you can see the associated entity and the time when those changes happened. So I think uh, if you need that kind of thing, uh, it's very, very powerful. Now, I did it, I just slapped at audited on all the entities in my application. Naturally, you may not want that for every entity in your in your, in your audit graph, and you don't need to, right? Um, you can use at audited on the entity that you care about, the ones that you want to be audited, uh, and you can also then um, uh, exclude other entities from that, for example. Uh, but if you do have an entity that references another one, for example, in this case, the customer references or the, the orders, then they both need to be audited, or you need to exclude it, right? And I forget what the, is it not audited? Yeah, not audited. So if you do that, you put that in the field here, then it'll exclude that from the auditing. It, it won't change, it won't capture the revisions to that subordinate collection there. But I prefer to capture it in this case. All right, um, so we've looked at JPA. JPA, of course, is a, uh, uh, trustworthy technology that's been around for a long time. Um, I think that uh, uh, for a lot of people, JPA is uh, going to be, a, you know, it's going to be a very convenient fit. Uh, it lets you work with objects, and, and if you're just trying to get a few objects in your domain model uh, persisted into a database, and you don't mind giving up some control over the queries, um, then you should you should uh, take a look at JPA. Um, there's some really good advice out there um, on on uh, how to improve JP performance uh, for example so uh, high persistence giving a shout out here to my to my uh, friend Vlad's amazing book so if you get a chance maybe read this 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 book um, you can buy it here at highpersistence.io uh, it's run it's written by Vlad Mihal Sia I'm not even I, I, I don't want to butcher his name but he's a um, Developer advocate. He's a developer advocate for the Hibernate team, and uh, you know he he's got some very good examples on how to make uh, Hibernate uh, absolutely scream in terms of speed. You know, so I definitely recommend that. Uh, I think uh, the most powerful part of your RDBMS is SQL, right? So I, I don't want to give up SQL. I don't want to have control. I don't want to lose that control. Uh, and so you you should be aware of these little uh, opportunities to regain that control. It's nice to have your objects mapped nicely to a uh, uh, to the different structures in your database but that shouldn't mean that you lose control and so it's very important to keep keep in mind what's happening behind the scenes that's why one of the first things I did was to uh, illustrate all the different SQL statements that are that are ex executing here when we run this code now keep in mind uh, it's not actually that imperformant to run a lot of SQL statements um, especially if you're doing it in a batch inside of a transaction it's imperformant to create if, if each one of these SQL queries was a separate transaction that would be very very slow but to run three or four SQL statements in a single transaction, that, 
it's it's painless you know um, we have looked at the absolute basics of JPA I didn't look at any sp any particular sp specific features of, uh, of our implementation we didn't spend a lot of time looking at mapping there's a you know there's billions of pages on, I'm sure on how to map entities to other types of entities I, I did a slightly more interesting example here with a map superclass uh, and a uh, uh, a one-to-many relationship, but there's a whole number of other things you can do here. Obviously, I hope you uh, will pursue that at your own leisure. Um, and uh, we looked at some of the things that could be considered anti-patterns, like this open entity manager and view thing. Some people really don't like that. And actually, Spring Boot, I, I think it will log it out, won't it? Let's see. Uh, scrolling. Scrolling. Well, I guess not. Warn, is it? Yeah, it d actually does. Look at that. So Spring JPA Open and View is enabled by default. Therefore, database queries may be for may be performed during view rendering. Explicitly configure blah 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 to disable this warning. So again, if you don't want that, um, you know, it's nice to know about it. It's nice to have it if you need it. And then if you're just trying to get an up an application up and running as quick as possible, as we did here, then that's the uh, that's the tool for you. Um, but otherwise, you might want to get rid of it, and uh, you know your mileage may vary when you start moving these wires over REST APIs and so on. So you have to you have to care about that. You have to care about what happens there. Uh, with that, my friends, uh, I thank you for watching, and I hope you got something out of this, and uh, we'll see you next time.